Hello everyone, welcome to episode 70 of Lesbian Talk. And I am probably the Amanda Hagen, and you are probably someone else. I'm Omega. Hooray. You can't see it, but we're sitting on a bed and there's the cutest cat curled up and being fluffy near us. And you couldn't see it, but she gave me like a hand signal to say, speak louder, and then she spoke much softer than I am. Hey, no I didn't. And there's also things going out in the street behind us, if you hear that. It's a busy day in Ireland. So, this episode, we're in the same room again, and it's going to be a an episode of two halves. The like first... we usually do, really. Well, yeah, but Giovanni's still in semi-retirement. I can hear you! I'm right up, I'm, I'm right above you. The first half being, of course, our recent trip to the magical land of Staffordshire. We went to England. It to... wasn't exactly by true, I mean, we went to England. We went to Stafford. Stafford. I mean, I even know that as an American. It's a small, if you don't know, it's a county town of Staffordshire in England. It's not, it's a very small town, um, but for some reason it's the capital of Staffordshire. I guess it's like the county seat. Yeah. And I went to university there, so we went over basically so I could show around the place, um, meet up with some of my friends from over there in England, and uh, go to a theme park. And see toilets that have no bearing on the way the actual world works. Yes. So... How did this trip go, and what did you see? Because I've seen it all. Well, we got up at two in the morning to get a taxi to a random area where we were told that a big old um, airport van would come. But I had my doubts, but it did come. So we finally got to Belfast Airport at, like, what, four in the morning? Uh, more like five. Five in the morning, and then... Hagen had everything fried ever for breakfast. Traditional Ulster fry with several types of weird bread. It was like a million o'clock in the morning, so I just had... There's a Starbucks there, so I got a skim chai and an apple and a scone. And she was like, I need all of the fried things! Catch passers-by and deep-fry them and put them on my fry as well. And you're giving so much detail that she's going to talk about the upholstery on the plane and what it was very nice. Then we got on the plane and then we went to Birmingham... And then we got a train from Birmingham to Stafford. We, we, we don't need to do this all in chronological order. We can talk just about highlights. Nope, chronological order. <sighs> well, fine, then you, 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 you mentioned you go then. Okay. Since obviously, I'm podcasting wrong. Well, it's, it's just a case of you're doing it very much like a travelogue in a Victorian style. Well, wouldn't that fit perfectly for visiting England? Not really, although you have to mention your big news that you've read today. Yes, yes. Interestingly enough, um, the Prime Minister of, I think he's probably, somebody important in Canada whose name is Stephen Harper has announced that uh, extensive scientific study has found one of the two ships from Sir John Franklin's doomed expedition. They don't know if it's um, the HMS Erebus or Terror yet, but that will, that story is developing, and it made me very happy. Dun, dun, dun. Omega is an expert in the Franklin Expedition. I'm not an expert. I've just read a lot about it. The experts are like... That's how experts work. Scientists, yes. But they have, like, actual research. I'm like, I read some books. But, yes, uh, day one was hanging out at Stafford. Uh, we went to the High House, one of the last remaining Tudor Mansion it's house, really, it's townhouses really impressive. in England. It was built 1590-something. Uh, it's four stories tall. It's really, really big. And they're all like, this is a room where... King Charles the First stayed for a little while during the Civil War, and, and they, when they tried to beat Cromwell, but failed. They have helpful, creepy mannequins. And don't worry, if you're watching the visual version, pictures that I took will be appearing in this spot. So if you're not watching the visual version, I guess you won't see that. So there you go. Yes, and um, hung around a 12th century church. That was kind of cool. And I don't know if you know him, but Davillo, you should totally follow him on Twitter. Who uh, he has a gaming, sh- he does uh, let's plays and stuff like that on YouTube had the same accent as the caretaker. Which is really weird, because the caretaker guy was from Staffordshire. He was from a town called Frog Hall. He was born in a town called Frog Hall, and if that doesn't sound like something right out of Wind of the Willows, I don't know what does. Yes. And that night, Omega had Thai food for the first time ever. No, I've had Thai food millions of times. It was good food. I mean, don't get me wrong. I had Thai a red, food for the first time ever. I had ever. a red curry, and that was pretty good. Um, for the first time ever. That's totally a lie. And you saw the black cat... That was like haunting. Yeah, there thing. was uh, there was an electronic store between the Thai restaurant and the Indian restaurant we went to the next night, and there apparently was a black cat living there, and it was like sitting in the window next to a toaster. It was kind of cool. It's constantly in the window. There's photos of that as well. Yeah. 
cat's just like, I'm a cat, I live right here and now. Yeah. The second day was the more important one. We went to Alton Towers, because apparently England has a theme park. You wouldn't, you know, it's got, guess it. It's got a couple. but Alton, It's got one theme park. <laughs> Alton Towers is the big one. It was the first big proper theme park in the UK, as far as I can tell. And it's all, it's noteworthy. Because we went there with the um, literally the entirety of the population of the Midlands that was under the age of seven. They were all we there. We attended there with them. They, they, they were with us. All, all at once. There were, I, I mean, it was a Saturday, but there was just little teeny kids running around everywhere, causing problems. Oh, pretty usual. Yeah. Okay. Um, for anyone in the state side, the UK doesn't really have the best climate for theme yeah, parks. Yeah. Thanks. So, in order for Fulton Towers to take off as a big American style theme park in the UK, basically what they've done, and this is a really good strategy is try to have as many world-first roller coasters as they can, or do something with a severe twist or something, just to get what roller coaster twist? fans interested so they go. Give them a reason to go. And, uh, for instance, Salton Towers was the first one to have a roller coaster. It had Oblivion, which was the first roller coaster which made you, which directed you on, in the car, right directly at the ground, and then launched you at the ground really, really fast, like for about five stories, and then veered you off into things. It was horrifying. I took one look at it, and I was like, oh, dear Jesus, fuck, no, that's not happening. And uh, it was the first one to do a legitimate, proper vertical drop in a roller coaster, as in the track vanishes, and the car falls into another track Which that's below. sounds like a great way to sustain a spinal cord injury. And uh, the saying. new one, which opened up, is the Smiler, which has 14 loops. And, uh... Although we should mention we weren't there alone. We were with your friend, Drew, mm -hmm. and his friend, Danica. We were also met by the fantastic, um, D-Man. Yes, uh, from Bryony. Twitter, and Bryony, who is his, uh, his girlfriend. And, and Andy also... Andy Weirs. Andy Weirs. From Attack of the 50 Foot Nerds. Metal Rocker! That's my metal voice. And from Fornus, <laughs> and who occasionally does some music for the Hagen Show. Yeah, so... We were supposed to have some other people, but they couldn't make it, but hopefully next time. Yeah. But, um, okay, we did all the cool rides. Oh, also, you guys, I got mozzarella sticks there. That was a mistake. Yeah. It did, they didn't <laughs> taste like mozzarella. It tasted like some kind of weird French goat cheese. It was very upsetting. No, she knows how I feel when I have fish and chips in America. Very. Like, how could you screw up mozzarella sticks? You can't. It's just like a stick of cheese. They even come pre-done. You just heat them. I don't even know. Yeah. Okay, I... I love Alton Towers. It's my favorite theme park, although I went to university in the area, but I didn't even realize it was so close until after I left. So every time I go back, I go to Alton Towers. I make sure I do, except for once when I went for a wedding. But um, out of the rides we went on, which was the ones that you find most noteworthy? Well, Duel was fun. It's like a ghost train ride where you have laser guns and you just shoot at things and you get points. And I was dual wielding like an American for a while, but it kind of hurt. And I got the most points. Yes, you did, and we went on a ride called Hex, which, Google this, because it, like, it's one of these rides that they give you a story of, oh, Lord such and such, from back in the day, did things and stuff, but most of the ride is actually constructed in part of this really historical building that's, like, from, like, the, when was it built? That part of it was probably built about 300 years ago. Yeah. So, then you come into this one room where you're strapped in, and it feels like you're, like, going around in circles upside down, but you're not. It's because the... You're going, like, moving back and forth and back and forth, but, like, like on a pirate, pendulum. Yeah, like, like on one of those pirate ship rides. But then there's a separate drum around you, which is the walls, and they're moving opposite you on a different time. So, if you, it's... Google it. Just look it up on YouTube. Yeah, it messes with your perception. I think it's called a Vacoma Madhouse ride, and there's only, like, four or five of them in the world. And I find the experience fascinating. I want to go on other ones. Yeah, that was fun. We went on a, a, a River Rapid rides. Where this people is the one can pay a pound to squirt you with a with a you know squirt gun, which I don't think is fair. Yeah, in the UK, uh, water rides are more of a challenge and a get and more of a challenge and a test because it's really cold climate. So the idea is you get wet the least, therefore you win. But on the outside, you've got people paying money to squirt with you because the UK theme parks are cruel. Yeah, pretty much. Although if I had you know if I felt like it and I had the time and inclination, I would have done the same thing. So. But the um the water rapids ride that is the one that was directly used as a com as okay in Chris Morris's Four Lions the River Rapids ride at Alton Towers was used 
by one guy to explain to another guy what heaven is like. It's like the River Rapids ride at Alton Towers with no cues. For life. Yes. Forever. So, I did not become radicalized, nor did I want to become an Islamic terrorist after going off in, on it. Which apparently is what happens in Four Lions. But yes, yeah, so we did that, and we went to a little aquarium, which was nice. We saw some pirate thing. manta rays and an octopus that wouldn't come out of its hole, and you know. And you got completely soaked in a flume, and you haven't forgiven me. <sighs> You're telling it wrong. So she's like, "Oh, you have to go to the log flume." I'm like, "I don't, I don't like a lot of rides. I don't. Gravity feels weird. It feels like the molecules in me are splitting apart by centrifugal force. I don't, I don't like them. I don't like being wet." And one of the reasons I don't like being wet dates back from, like, when I was a little teeny kid. Like, if I would, you know, go in the pool and come out, and my mom would be like, it was, it's was it been hours, why haven't you taken off your, your, your bathing suit yet and got changed the regular clothes? Because, you know, when you're a kid, you'll just have your bathing suit on all day, running around being, you know, an, an asshole. And I was like, well, I'll do it later. She's like, you've been sitting around in a, in a wet bathing suit, you're going to get crotch rot. Now, I don't know what crotch rot is, I don't know if that's the clinical term for it, it was never explained to me what crotch rot is. If you have crotch rot, write the show. But, so I, I equate being damp and being in, you know, in, in cold, wet clothing with growing a fungus. Probably because, you know, black mold is so prevalent in the States. So I was like, I don't want to get wet. There's no sun shining. You know, it's like, you know, if you go into like Dorney Park, Wild Water Kingdom, you'd be dry in like 20 minutes because the sun is so strong. It was kind of cloudy and kind of cold. So I was like, I don't really want to do this. And she looked at me with big puppy dog eyes. She's like, but you have to because it's my favorite and I want to show it to you. I want it to be special. And I was like, <sighs> Yeah, but someone else tried to make you be in the front of the, of the flume. Yes. And, and I D-Man was you. like, we'll make Omega be in front. I was like, no. I was like, no, it'll be me or you, D-Man. And then I was like, I will go in the front and I will take the brunt of the water. So, yeah. So we get on this ride and I sit it's, down. It's about 30 years old. It's very, very rickety at this point. Yeah, and I sort of sit down, and it doesn't have seats. It just has this this plastic rod, like like this plank that you sit on, and you can feel both of your butt bones intimately. And so I'm like, ow, my butt. And so they oh, it's too late, time to go. So it pulls you up these little, you know, lift thingies so it, you can get more height. And when you do that, gravity takes effect. So I'm, like, clinging on to these metal bars so I don't fall back and crush D-Man. And I'm like, this is all kinds of pain for me. And then we go down a little fall. And I was like, oh. And, we, and you're like, oh, oh, oh. I forgot there's one little drop, but, but there's nothing till the big drop. I'm like, all right. So we go through this forest. And for like an hour before the ride, she was like, when you see the duck, you will die. When you see the duck, you will die. And I was like, what does that mean? And she's like, ah, from the grudge, you know? I'm like, all right. Oh, whatever. It's, no, it's from the like, American remake of Rain. Whatever. And I'm like, okay, fine. So then, you know, we go through this little, like, winding place, you know, in the woods and stuff. And so then we go up another lift, another hill kind of thingy, into it looks like, you know, like a some kind of sawmill. And there's a loud trick that's, that's, that's quacking. And that's when all hell broke loose. Because then you go into the dark, there's, like, psychotic ducks, there's water, like, being sprayed on you, and then there's a drop that you don't know, you can't even see because you're in the P- dark. Pitch black. And this is all, like, rickety and, and banging my butt bones even more. And the demon was like, bah, ha, ha, isn't it all for fun? I'm like, no. My butt bones hurt. My wrists hurt from clinging on this thing so it don't fall into you. This is not fun for me. And so then and then we come out of, like, the sawmill, and we're coming up to the big drop, the big-ass drop. And I had the presence of mind to make a, dark, I'd make a Dragon Age joke right before we plunged. I said, make her preserve us. And he did not. It, I'm gonna have to join the queue. The big drop is the maker was, forsake me. For, for the so- big drop is basically two stories. It's nowhere near as big as say Splash Mountain or anything. Right, but you were in the front, and you were way more than me somehow. We got soaked. I was in a poncho, and my 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 sneakers were soaked, my socks were soaked, and then we're coming out of there, and then more bastard kids are shooting us with water guns, and we got off, and I was like. <laughs> But I was already thinking, what can I negotiate out of this? What treat can I get later? You know, and I say, oh, I didn't want to do this, and you made me. Well, I, I understand you. rape culture now on the internet, because I said no, and no one believed that no meant no. I told D-Man that I would be in the front if you'd buy me um, Ben and Jerry's, and you never did. <gasps> yeah, it's true. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. But yes, Alton Towers is fun. If you're visiting England from America or something, go to Alton Towers. It's it's amusing. It's got some very good roller coasters. I went on Rita, Queen of Speed. And I just keep thinking of Rita's Water Ice that I originally talked about that, or the Beatles song about Rita the Meter Maid. Basically goes from not to 70 miles per hour in about two seconds. It's hydraulics. Yeah, it was like, phew. But yeah, so we did that, and then we came back to Stafford, and we went to an Indian place called Nishad's, which was really great. I mean, it was very amazing food, but I was starving. If you're from Stafford, so write good. the show. Yeah. Um, but I think I committed a faux pas, because I didn't realize... See, usually in America, if you ordered something that is involving rice, you just get rice. But you have to order your rice separately at, like, Thai places and Indian places if you get a curry. I don't know why, because what they expect you're going to put the curry on, but whatever. So I was like, I want this kind of curry, please. And he's like, that's cool. I think I think traditionally rice, you have rice or a naan bread. Oh. And so the guy was like, oh, okay, well, what kind of rice do you want? And I was like, do you have brown rice? And he gave me this look like there was something wrong with me. And he's like, oh, we have this kind of rice and this kind of rice. I was like, okay, that kind of rice then. So I know he went back in the kitchen and was like, America and brown rice? In Indian cuisine, faux pas. Racist. And I had a naan bread that was really good. It had like this lamb mince on the inside. That was pretty good. Yep. The next day we hung out in Stoke, went to pubs, and we played some LARPing. Yeah. We, we LARPed at this really, really, really amazing club called Bunker 13. And they're on Facebook, so give them a like if you can. A pottery center in Stoke. It's done up like, you know, in this kind of like post-apocalyptic nuclear. It's just, it's awesome. They have a wall of gas masks. The bartender is incredibly friendly, and she makes really good drinks. And the the main part of the bar is has really nice nuclear holocaust theming, but then the the bathrooms have the real thing. It's like actual oh, nuclear holocaust. It's wonderful. The, the, the bathroom was the. I've been in worse bathrooms in clubs. I've been in in clubs where there are no there's no doors on the stalls, and you're in like about a few inches of water. It was just a club bathroom. That's just holocaust bathroom. Oh, not holocaust bathrooms. Well, surprisingly, I did not pay for any drinks because uh, Bryony kept giving me drinks, which is nice. She's like, here, try this alcohol. And I was like, oh, for free. I will try this alcohol. I bought you a drink, didn't I? Uh, no, but I shared your Diet Pepsi that I bought for you. I'm sure I bought you a drink. You didn't buy uh -huh. me a drink. But anyway, so I yeah, was we did that. hard liquor all night. She was not. She had a drink that was like, actually, it sounded pretty good. It was like a toffee apple schnapps with Coke. Diet Coke? Diet Coke, yeah. Yeah, so that sounded pretty good. So we did that, and then we wore bee vampires for a while, but then the fight broke out, and we are like, it's going to take forever, so we went home. <laughs> Basically. And that's the story of that. We watched BBC. We watched a show, oh my gosh, we watched this show called Newcastle After Dark, or something like that. Omega had never been exposed properly to Newcastle before. This was, oh, I, I've heard, like, stories. But this was a show about, like, this place in, in Newcastle, like, the, the bar street where everyone goes to drink and party, and they have this an ambulance, and an ambulance crew that stay, hangs out there all night to, like, help people out, you know, like if they're drunk and throwing up and just need a place to like sleep it off, or if they, you know, all the girls wearing these insane heels, a lot of them, you know, broke or sprained ankles and all sorts of fun. It was a great show, and I enjoyed it very much. And then we woke up the next day and just wandered around bonking into each other. Then we took the train to Birmingham, we're at Birmingham Airport for a million, million years, and got the Yes, that, that day's not so interesting to hear about. Back to Belfast, we had to wait for the airporter. And then, <laughs> That's a very thrilling day, let's do it. We ate so many different kinds of fast food and chips. I had, I don't, you know, fries, I don't eat, I would eat fries maybe like once every two weeks. I've had so many chips and fr you know, and crisps and things in the past few days. I feel like I'm on like, like a potato Overload. You have to get used to the UK. Oh, Chips potatoes. on everything, every day. No, no. But was it worth it going to the Midlands? Yeah, I mean, it, that certainly was England, that right there. We saw some castle ruins. We were driving on the highway. People were English all over the place, you know. You only had one curry, though. You're supposed to have a lot of curries when you go to the Midlands. It's the king of the curry making part of the well, UK. Well, the curry that I had was good. Another thing, you guys, like, so anytime we were in, they had all these, like, like just, like, mini casinos and bookmakers, and they encouraged you to gamble all the time, and we were, we were at the arcade, one of the arcades at Alton Towers, they have one of those machines where you have a whole bunch of coins, and they have, like, prizes on top of the coins, you have to put coins in and make them drop to knock the coins down to make the prizes fall down, and they have one that's like the one in the, um, uh, in the, the arcade in Derry, and it's big two pence coins. Now Google two pence coins because they're huge. They're these friggin' copper monstrosities. And so on the machine that took the two pence coins, 
was a notice that like kind of like no one to start before you stop gambling and uh, and the line that you can call for gambling addiction help on the two pence machine. And so we were walking this was the next day we were walking through Stoke or no Stafford. And I was saying, look, there's there's another gambling place. Why have so much gambling? I mean, you know, because I'm from Pennsylvania, and we have strict gambling laws in the same way that some states do. And so then about two minutes later, this guy comes up to me. He's like, hey, can I talk to you for a second? We're like, what's up? And he goes, I'm collecting money, be- you know, because of it's too easy for children to gamble, and we need to, like, raise the gambling age and help people with gambling age. And I was like, see? Oh, my gosh. We were just talking about that. So I gave him two pounds. I don't see it as any more of advice uh, as anything else. Well, it's not, but you should still, if someone has a gambling addiction, you, they want yeah, to help Yeah, if them. someone has an addiction for anything and they want rid of it, then good, they should get help. No one to stop before but we stop. I don't find anything nasty about gambling. As far as I'm concerned, having gambling things everywhere, it's no worse than having uh, places that sell sandwiches everywhere. Yeah, but it's different because... I find sandwiches a much bigger vice than gambling. No, it's gambling. not. Because, all right, if you take a dollar let's say, and you put it in a slot machine, you're probably not getting that dollar back. If you take a dollar to McDonald's and you buy one of those old junior hamburgers off of the dollar menu, you are definitely getting a burger. You are definitely have exchanged money for goods and services, but if you gamble, you're probably not getting that back. It's like taking it and like dropping it down the sewer. Yeah, but gambling's more entertaining. You're spending your money on the entertainment. And well, you might get you might get it back. I mean, I can not. I can see that if it's a game of skill like poker or something, because that you know poker is a bit random chance, but also depending on your skill. If you stick a, a pound coin into a slot machine, you're not probably not getting that back. The reason yeah. that you gamble is because you hope you hope you hope you'll make. Well, extra I made money. I made the example of sandwiches because I don't care for, particularly for sandwiches. That's because you have a brain. So you know I. I'm like oh if I spend five quid on a sandwich and then you know I theoretically you know. But that money is gone because sandwiches are crap. I could have spent it on better things. But you never know. Once in a million years, I might accidentally find a tanner in the sandwich. So sorry, that would be really concerned. unhygienic. As far as I'm concerned, sandwiches are just like gambling, but gambling's better because I at least am amused by doing it with the 2P machines. All right, so moving on to Doctor Who, because I really have nothing to say about that. Like, I could start tearing it apart, but we'd be another ten minutes arguing the semantics of the first sentence and your hatred of sandwiches. So, honey, what did we watch this week? Actually, about 20 minutes ago. Yeah, it's currently Monday. Yeah. Um, no, no, no Tuesday. Tuesday. Yeah, we got back on Monday, didn't Sorry we? Sorry about that. Robot of Sherwood, which yeah. is really stu- it's, it's just stupid from the ground up because there's more than one robot in it. I had issues with it. Apparently, everyone on the internet had did, so... Pretty much anything that we say, you'll probably have already read on five different kinds of social media. Although I do like the doctor being, like, all persnickety. Like, shut up, I'm right, I'm the doctor. This is stupid. And you're crap. Arr. But I had some nice, like, throwbacks, you know. Not very good. Definitely not very good. Not as good as Into the Dalek. Yeah, I like to... Oh, the, one thing that was good about this episode, I like how Clara tried to be like, Aha, I'm clever, and actually that got me nothing. Oh yeah, spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. By now you should know, so don't freak the fuck out. Okay. The you got the nineteen fifties style Robin Hood running around and being all like haha and slapping his thigh and everything. But then but you got the doctor coming with all these theories about why he is there because that's absolutely ridiculous. But then the big twist is that he's actually just like that and it's they could have made it nicely subversive, but they didn't. Well, it, it could have been, like, maybe we'll find out next season or something, because Stephen Moffat likes to do shit like this, that actually they weren't robots, but they were taken from some other... Like, the Doctor's like, well, we could be entrapped in a cinescope, just like what happened in... What was the episode? Carve of Monsters. Yes, which we already covered, like, about a few months ago, so check that out. Or maybe it's like this, maybe it's a future amusement park for space travelers, which has been the plot of a few different Doctor Who episodes. But... I mean, Clara was a little bit annoying, and I only person I really liked in this episode was the Doctor. I really, really, really wanted the Sheriff of Nottingham to actually have been the Master the whole time. That would have been really good. He did look like Anthony Ainley's Master. They're like, haha, Doctor, it was me, the Master, it was me the whole time. You thought I was the Sheriff of Nottingham. Although, it was real, the it's distracting that he's pretending to be the Master, though. I'm really glad that he wasn't the Master, because 
That guy should not be allowed to play the master. No, but you know what I mean. That would have been cool. He could have pulled off a, pulled off the chair from Nottingham actor match. Remember that it was the master the whole time. But yeah, and there was the. Mark Gatiss was one of the League of Gentlemen. Why does he constantly do these? Maybe really, he, really he wrote a really and... good script, and other people interfered and changed it and made it bad. No. 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 You don't think so? No. How do you know? You don't know. No. But you don't know. But no. so stop it. But yeah, so it was. Uh, it kind of felt like watching a Renaissance Fair play, quite honestly. Uh, Gatiss, like he has done one. Episode. Sorry, he's done two episodes that were not incredibly light, frivolous, rompy type things. And it's like, the guy's one of the League of Gentlemen. The League of Gentlemen do really, really dark and grotesque comedy. Why the fuck do they give him this stuff to do? Like or, I said, maybe he didn't have a lot of control. Maybe, like, you know, Stephen Moffat. You Smith. must do it this way. It's, I am Stephen Moffat. Get oh, Reese Shearsmith to write it. Yeah. Get Reese Shearsmith to write the show. But, yeah, I mean, there's. I feel like I should have more to say about it, but it was just kind of like, well, that happened. I'm pretty sure Patrick Troughton turned up. Yeah, that was kind of cool. There was a nice little still shot of Patrick Troughton and his Robin Hood. Yeah, they were like, here's the other pictures of Robin Hood in popular culture. And Ro- Robin Troughton was the first, I believe, in British history to play Robin Hood on screen. And actually, someone tweeted at um, TV in a way. Fraser Hines the other day. And was like, what did you think of the Patrick Trotton cameo? And he was like, loved it. And I saw it because he just tweeted that, like, right before we started the show. So that was good, I guess. We had another reference to the Promised Land. Because, you know, that's going to be a thing by the end of the season. Yeah, it's very good. <laughs> Moffat. We are really happy if it ends up being, like, some, like, you know, kind of one of, like, one of the Kellogg's retreats or something like that. Well, they already did the evil health retreat though in Red, in Crim in um, Crimson Horror. Yep, they also did it mm. in um, yeah. Leisure Hive. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, but that was like back in the day though. I mean, like the nineteenth century. Well, we shall get up at dawn and we shall eat cornflakes so we will not become masturbators, and then we will get a constitutional with some fresh air, ha 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 ha, and also live forever, and Jesus. So yeah, the Leisure Hive was more seventies. No, eighties. Eighties. Whatever. <laughs> the I promise on shit I don't care about. The okay. Doctor Who is a story is a series that long season arcs don't work in. You gotta have someone influencing it from the outside. Like the master. The only characters who are continuous in Doctor Who are the Doctor and the companions. Then getting involved with a bunch of things which are all connected to something, to things which are all connected to each other in quick succession is absolutely fucking ridiculous. It's like, here we are in 1190-ish, and oh, look, Promised Land things. Oh, here we are, we were in the Victorian era. Oh, look, more Promised Land stuff. This is absolutely, this is, this creates... I think you're kind of waiting for Bad Wolf to be written somewhere. That would just make your head explode. This damages the suspension of disbelief. How? I mean, you can have long, long because oh, stuff isn't this, like that. isn't this convenient? We're going to all the things that are connected to this season in this season. Well, but, 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 but here's what you're not thinking. You're not thinking on the grand scale. You're thinking in bottles. Like, bottle episodes is what I mean. Like, okay, look at it from one point of view. You're always saying that, oh, the Doctor is, you know, he's so much better than all of his enemies, so he's, you know, kind of like, quote-unquote, the authority, and he's the biggest, the baddest, blah, 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 blah. But, you know, what if they're introducing a new villain who is the Doctor's equal or his better? Wouldn't the doc- someone who was the Doctor's equal or his better be also been able to manipulate his movements subtly? Or unsubtly, that's basically what happened in the key to time. And that's why you have an outside influencer who is powerful enough to do that. And that's fine. But they have done this every single fucking season. Because of if this you want to have somebody who, this, who's actually a threat to the Doctor, they have to be pretty powerful. Yeah, but they have done this without doing that every single season well, of the new series. I, I, that's as, why as, I'm complaining. As a, as a writer, as a world builder, as someone who thinks about this kind of stuff, I'm kind of interested to see where it's going. Well, you can be. I just. I would just love an entire series of New Who where the stories are only connected by the Doctor, the TARDIS, and the Companions. So you're, you're just saying what you want is bottle episodes. 
They're not bottle, bottle episodes means that they're a cheap episode done in existing sets. No, bottle, no, I, no, I mean stand like... Standalone episodes. Yeah, well, okay, well, in the States, we call them bottle episodes because it's like the plot exists in that one bottle and there you go. No, it's, no, the bottle episodes are the cheap ones to, to, so you can pay for expensive stuff in other episodes. If you say so, I'm just telling you how... My friends and I have utilized the phrase in the past, I will get in my TARDIS, go back in time, and tell them that they're wrong because you said so in the future. So basically you're saying, I like a different plot than you, but you're wrong because I know more about Doctor Who. No, I'm saying that this okay. show is not suited to modern st TV style with arcs that are all connected in, in a season or something. But it can be, just because it's not traditionally its way doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. No, Doctor Who's always... Classic Who does the, the arc things, because quite often episodes would lead into each other directly, even between stories. But the idea of having them building up to something at the end of the season, that's the ridiculous thing. The connector is always the companions and the Doctor and the TARDIS. Because the main character... Right, but what I'm saying is it could be good. You don't know because you haven't seen it yet. So to automatically say, well, they're doing it wrong, and wrong, and wrong, and wrong. I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're doing it wrong. What I'm saying is that I am, I am absolutely sick of this crap happening every single fucking season. She said? Yeah. Season one, their bad wolf thing, although it, Russell T. Davies apparently mistook a recurring motif as an arc, although that kind of made sense. It's foreshadowing. A little bit. Tiny foreshadowing. bit. Foreshadowing. Torchwood? Ooh. No fucking sense. Mr. Saxon stuff? No fucking sense. Was it season four? Missing Planets? No fucking sense. Uh, season five? Season five? Uh, the Pandorica thing uh, didn't really build up to that, but it happened, so that gets a sort of a reprieve. Oh, well, look, season five is the best season of New Who so far. Uh, season six, we've got the Doctor leading up to his death when he regenerates, even though he can't regenerate according to Moffat. Moffat, the guy who's obsessed with like working out these long and large puzzles and everything, and then it, and then acts like everyone else is stupid when they point out that he can't remember what he did two fucking episodes earlier. Um, you know that season six, no fucking sense. Sort of. Seven. Looks fucking sense. This one, they're doing the same thing. Just, like I said, I don't know. I, I just think that you're so excited about hating things, and you're so into, like, oh, things well, aren't exactly the way that I would have done them that makes them bad, that I think you're kind of, it's kind of blinding you to things that can possibly be good. I mean, it might be good, but the main characters can li literally you, leave this time and space so they, there is no way the logical reason for them to constantly return to the same motifs in this order if but Mon if they're being manipulated ah, yes, if, ah from the outside yes, if they're doing that that's clever that makes more sense. that's what that's yes what but I'm you saying. can't say it doesn't make sense now just because it hasn't been the end yet that's like taking take you know you know reading the first two chapters of a book and saying well i don't know how the ending's going to be so this makes no sense if the ending ties things up, the end of the season, you know, reveals stuff, of course things won't make sense until they're revealed. And you go, ah, oh, oh I see, that's what, oh, that's why they well, did this. And the, I, oh, I see, oh, that was clever. It's nice of you to give them the benefit of the doubt, but several times, the, several seasons, this show has done this exact thing, and it has not made sense, and it has just been a series of motifs that happened just because it's convenient but for no, our season arc. But okay, but the Bad Wolf stuff, that's... There's a word for that. It's called foreshadowing. Bad Wolf was the one was one of the ones that made sort of sense. I'm talking the the three this thing... really horrible examples are seasons two, three, and four. Well, I'm just looking at what we're talking about right now. I think that it's not really as bad as you think that it is. I and, the like a, and, and the categories of things. I would like a season of disconnected episodes. I don't want to know about epic things that are happening. If you want to have a big story at the end, fine. I but I do not want them to reference something every single episode or two just so that we can reveal what's going on in the last episode. Like, Everything was better when it was mine. Back in the day when old who was like this. Oh my gosh, I'm old. Should I fetch you your soup? Because you're old and you want your soup. I'm old, where's my soup? But yeah, so I I just, I mean, like, I'm not saying this was a good episode, but what I'm saying is that I think that you're so excited to get angry that you're looking for things to get angry about. No. I mean, like, this was just basically what I was just a fluff episode. It's like nothing really important happened. We had a companion betray the Doctor yet again and be like, let me tell you the Doctor's whole entire history. By the one person who probably does know the Doctor's whole entire history. And he's like, she shouldn't have told you that. And I was like, damn right. But yeah, so, um, I mean, it was, I don't really know what else we could say. It just wasn't a very 
it had a couple of good episode. bits. It had a couple of good bits. The doctor using technology to uh, to do the arrow thing at the part way through. I like that. Well, Hug, you're such an awesome archer. Yeah, well, I think she was cheating. I like that they they portray Robin Hood as using the Mongol hold uh, for drawing back a bowstring, which is said said to be easier to do when you know in motion. And they had the the sheriff using the traditional two fingered uh, hold. Said the archery nerd. I'm pretty sure the science in this doesn't work on about 18 different levels. Yeah, he's like, oh, we need more gold so the ship can achieve orbit. And then the arrow will touch the outside of the ship. Gold is not a very good conductor. I mean, it's used in some electronics, but... And if you you know more about the applications of gold in electronics, please do comment. But as far as I'm aware, copper is a much better conductor. I mean, I can't can't pretend to to know what they were going to do with that engine or how the alien engine worked. But like, oh, we need... Gold and a lot of that gold back then had pretty lousy purity too. It had a lot of imperfections. So then the gold would have to be purified after it was melted down and yeah. Yeah, you get all that problem and then at the very end they're like, We're gonna solve the, the problem by firing this gold arrow at the spaceship and we're not even gonna make it fly into the engine or something. It just touched it and they're like, Oh, it's enough energy, we're we're good now. Yeah. It's it's so it looks as though the gold arrow the force of the gold arrow hitting the spaceship pushed it into orbit. Wow, Doctor, that was an amazing show. It's like an inversion of the Cybermen's, you know, their issues with gold. Yeah, I thought, like, the reason he was collecting gold was to melt it down so he could make, you know, weapons for his troops and then go off and fight the Cybermen. That would have been kind of cool. Again, you were using the Cybermen for things that make slightly more sense in your, in, in, than the thought they used in the episode. Well, I'm thinking about the Cybermen because you just bought that anniversary issue of Doctor Who magazine I was reading on the plane. It was all about the Cybermen. Like the, uh... <laughs> okay, and originally in the Cybermen had no issues with gold, then... Uh, Revenge of the Cybermen happened, and then the Cybermen suddenly gold will clog their re- their respiratory systems, and then they die. So you can then, make like kind of like a gold dust mace and mace the Cybermen in the face. You could, yes. But then, by the time Silver Nemesis happened, the Cybermen would be killed by gold if it touched them, admittedly with some force, like slingshot, gold-tipped arrows killed Cybermen. What is it? Maybe, what is it about the properties of gold that that apparently in the sh- the context of the show have vastly gold dust just clogged their respiratory. no no no. But I mean now like this and then 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 that you know episode apparently gold in the Who universe has a lot yeah, of different electric they electrical never explained properties. They just ran for it with it, and uh, but then in uh, Silver uh, Nightmare in Silver. The doctor manages to get his mind back from being like cyber converted semi by sticking some gold on his face, and it's like. You, Fucking. Yeah, I'm really interested to know what electrical properties New Who thinks um, gold has. So if you know right, Joe. I don't think they even know what the word electrical properties means. Well, so, uh, someone's got to know something about science. No. It's science fiction. Although I do like that basically when they, the Doctor and Robin Hood enter the spaceship, he's like, oh, thank God, something real. I'm like, wow, the Doctor likes crunchy sci-fi. He hates fantasy. Good. Game of Thrones isn't real. Jon Snow, you're not real. Winter is not coming. Ironically, the one who said, um, you know nothing, Jon Snow. She's allegedly the new companion. Apparently. Dr. Clara. Apparently. I mean, I don't know. Companion, well, I'm just... Clara did a lot... She felt like... To me, it felt like she fit a lot better with the 11th Doctor. And now she's kind of like, look, I'm special. The Doctor's like, whatever, I'm old and I hate you. And this new guy... You know, PTSD soldier. I'm not sold on him either. He's in the next episode. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to see. I just don't really... Yeah. You know. But I like the Doctor a lot. I like him squabbling like a child with with um, Robin Hood. It reminded me a lot of the Sixth Doctor, so that made me happy. The, 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 the Doctor winning a sword fight with Robin Hood armed with a fucking spoon? Well, he had to be cheating somehow. Oh. We just didn't admit to it yet. I really thought he was going to reach into his pocket... It's intending to pull out a sonic screwdriver and pull out the spoon by accident with it when he accidentally it's put it in there. F- f- fucking ridiculous. It's they were making all this jazz about how the new, you know, Capaldi's doctor they're changing the tone of the show because, you know, the same old stuff's not gonna work with Capaldi and how the what was new with Matt has become old and it's like You're fucking bullshitting us. You just constantly well, Maybe maybe he maybe the doctor was so pissed off and so annoyed that some guy was like, Oh Robin Hood after he just got done saying Robin Hood's not real, he's like not only am I going to hand you your hat hand, boy, but, you know, I'm going to do it with a spoon. Because, and I know my mother would say the same thing if she were here. If it would have been John Pertwee, he would have actually pulled out a rapier and, you know, dueled with the guy. 
But I think, you know, the, the doctor was like, I'm just so annoyed at this point, I'm going to fence with you with a spoon. The only possible way that the spoon thing could, they could maybe get away with it is if it was a reference to Prince of Thieves, if I will cut your heart out with a spoon. Maybe. But, or he did, again, or he did something to the spoon, like it had some kind of strange magnetic thing that he did, like, years beforehand. Well, when I'm complaining about them not doing new things, what I'm complaining about is the uh, whole episode. It's a basic comedy lark episode, which they've been doing every single fucking year since it began. Old Who had its problems, but they would choose a tone, stick with it for a few years, choose another tone, and it would change, and the show would constantly change. New Who would get stuck in a rut because... They have, this is the horror episode, this is the comedy episode, this is the epic episode that doesn't have quite enough money to make it look believable. Because, because, go with me for a second, they are doing a theme, and maybe that's the new part of the theme. Maybe now fans are coming to, you know, fans of New who have, who have been growing up with the show because they aren't old enough to have watched it originally, or they're not old enough to have sought it out, you know, on DVD or on, you know, on the internet. And now they're, oh, oh, I wonder what, quote-unquote, the horror episode will be next season. I can't wait to find out what the comedy one would Because you have to accept the fact that the show realizes that its audience is changing. The world is changing, and the show has to change. And, you know, maybe you don't like the changes, and that's totally cool. You know, you don't have to, but you have to acknowledge that things will eventually change. The Doctor changes. The sh the, in fact, that's the endemic nature of the show, is the changing of the Doctor. I, ah, I think, uh -huh, that was pretty pretty poetic one there, buddy. I'm, I'm finding it really amusing that your your argument is that I don't like change, and if what I'm complaining about is that the show is stuck sticking itself into a rut where it's doing the same thing over and yes, over again but, rather but, than changing. But, but what you keep saying is it's doing it in a rut because an old show back in the day is mm -hmm. any different than by yeah, they changed it. Like, they changed it completely. Maha, maha. But in between one season... Okay, Tom Baker's era. First couple of years was horror. It was dark. They had a lot of blood, a lot of violence. Then one season, then suddenly with no change, but over the course of one season, it became a zany comedy show, very witty, but not very brilliant. Then it became a hard science fiction show. Literally, one season ended, the next one started, and it was a completely different show. Okay. New Who doesn't have the guts to do that, apparently. Now, Moffat's stuff is different from Russell T. Davies. Russell T. Davies is basically the soap opera years. Moffat's one is the ill thought out sort of fairy tale logic years. But what I'm talking about is the, how the seasons are constructed. They have similar constructions, which makes the show overall feel samey. Well, I'm just saying. Although, speaking of the fairy tales and happy endings and stuff, the, the end of it kind of felt very... I, I've actually, the whole thing kind of felt very Pratchett-esque. You know, with the, the, the reliance on, well, this is the trope of Robin Hood. Can't you see? These are the fairy tale tropes. You know, when, when he says, you know, this, she, of course she had started the story, of course it would keep on going, you know. My story is the same as your story, and we all need... This kind of hero, it felt very Pratchett esque. So that actually, that part actually was good to me. Oh well, no, okay, let me let me put it this way. That that part felt cool to me if you know Terry Pratchett had been a guest writer. I'm like, oh well, that's very Pratchett esque. But I don't know that Mark Gatiss, you know, does the same thing. I want Charlie Brooker to write an episode. That would be fucking no. If Charlie Brooker wrote an episode, like the Doctor would have to take down an evil. Media Corporation, and that happened already. No. Oh. Because Charlie Brooker's like, let me tell you what about television. Oh, I hate it. Except for I love it. Except yeah. for I hate it. His, his show, Black Mirror, that should be... I would love to see Charlie Brooker be in charge of Doctor Who. Probably the new head is going to be Anthony Horowitz, who apparently is good, but he also did t Crime Traveler, which was fucking awful. So, I'm like, okay. A, com a completely clean break, though, because he hasn't written for New Who yet. Well, there you go. But yeah, all in all, I mean, what you if you if you tuned in to this episode to hear what we were gonna say about this episode, you already knew what we were gonna say about this episode. So so that's that in a nutshell. What's so the one the the teaser for next week looked pretty good. Listen, I am anticipating being broadly okay with. Um, I am anticipating being very pissed off with part of it. I anticipate that as well. Now, thank you. Thank you for that. But yeah, so so we'll, we'll have hopefully we'll have the next episode up relatively soon after uh, the Doctor Who episode airs. We were in England this week, so it didn't happen. Like I said, the next few weeks are going to be a little catch as catch can, and our schedule might not be uh, completely like it used to be because I'm in the process of moving into the place where I'm going to be living. 
Uh, my orientation starts tomorrow, and then classes will begin soon. I thought your orientation that. was lesbian. Ha ha ha. I slapped my knee at that. Robin Hood said. But yeah, so you know what to expect from us. The same thing that you always yeah. do. Whenever you have an episode of Doctor Who, it's about Robin Hood, and it reminds me more of Maid Marian under Merry Man, but it's not as good as Maid Marian under Merry Man. You got a slight problem. Watch Maid Marian. Or watch the Disney one where it's animated in their foxes. I used to have that on VHS when I was little. But, yeah, and we're, we'll, we'll be getting back to Giovanni's trivia time, trivia question. We're going to be getting a lot of stuff back in line soon. We have a new show that we just started. Uh, we have the first two episodes done. The second will be going up on Blip soon called Lex Appeal, going through um, the Canadian slash British slash German slash everybody um, show Lex, which I've never seen, but Hagen can't shut up about, so... If you can't shut up about it either, you can watch along with us. We can talk about Lex and Alton Towers and create a singularity. I'm Doctor Who. A singularity of something, that's for sure. But anyway, this has been episode 70. I've been the Omega Geek, and who would you have one to have been this time? Someone who's deeply angry about everything. Well, you've succeeded. Boy, have you succeeded.